Welcome to Uncontained, episode 155. I'm your host, Aaron Static Render, and on the show today, I speak with San Francisco-based stand-up comic Stephanie Foster, and we meet up at her day job, which, in my opinion, is a pretty badass day job. She works at Pereira Odell, which is an advertising agency in downtown San Francisco, and, uh... Yeah, very cool place, and lots of cool chandeliers, and a certain faux bearskin rug uh, that uh, it comes up in the interview more than one time. But this interview is a fun one. We get to talk about how and where she got into stand-up comedy. I feel it appropriate to throw out a Got Milk ad that I came up with when I was like 12 or 13 years old, and uh, debut that for you. Other, other than that, it's nowhere on the internet, so it's about time to get it out there. We also talk about what it's like on stage, her writing process, and what it's like being from a small town in Texas and now doing stand-up in San Francisco. So I imagine there's a little bit of a contrast there. And Stephanie also shares a nice little fable with me that I didn't know before we started recording this. So you learn something new every day. Now, plug in those earbuds if you haven't already. This is how comedian Stephanie Foster lives uncontained. How are you doing today, Stephanie? Doing so good. Thank you for meeting with me here and uh, bringing me into your day job, which <laughs> is uh, working in an advertising agency. Yeah. So before we get into the comedy, like, what's that like, like working in an ad agency? Is it all fun and games like some people think or? It's best of both worlds, right? Like, <laughs> it's absolutely fun and games. I've worked in the advertising industry my entire career okay and i keep coming back because it's the best people i've ever met i get to work with they're super smart they're super funny there's very little rules inside these walls and okay. so we get our space to be creative and be ourselves and whatever that happens to be that day so very cool very cool and you're on the business side of it kind yeah. of, which kind of surprises me with you being a stand-up comic and all it surprises every well i think the stand-up <laughs> comedy surprises people because i am on the business side of it okay um but yeah i've always wanted to write and be a creative and i think you know even i went to school to be in advertising okay which is so weird i'm one of those people who actually did what they majored in uh, <laughs> um, but I did and I love it, but I always thought I should be on that side of the building. Um, but I really am good at talking okay. and that's what my side of the building is about is being the liaison between the creatives and the client and selling the idea through and making sure things happen. And so okay, that's actually given me a bit of an edge as a comedian yeah um, because I know how to run a business and so much of this is running a business. Very true, very true. And that's what a lot of creatives, from what I understand, struggle with as yeah. well. They like, okay, I do the art, but I feel dirty charging for it, or I feel like I don't understand exactly how the business aspect of it works. So that definitely would be a perk on your side of that. Yeah, totally. And that part for me is the easy part. That part I can do in my sleep and the writing and the creative side and getting that side out of me yeah. is the biggest struggle and the hardest part for me. Very cool. And that's probably why you got into stand up. So as I was telling you beforehand, I figured this is the best time yeah. to throw it out. As we came in here, I told you when I was a kid, I came up with a got milk ad. It, don't look for it. It's not on the air anywhere. <laughs> it's not on the world wide web until, until now. All right. So it starts out this old uh, Western saloon, okay? This this guy walks <laughs> oh, wow. in. Yeah, yeah, this guy. <laughs> this starts strong. <laughs> exactly. With like the good, the bad, and the ugly whistling or something okay, like okay. that going on because I understand copyright infringements <laughs> and all that crap. I'm with you. But, I'm with you. But this guy walks in. He's like shaking looking at this guy in the bar. He, The guy at the bar turns to him kind of Clint Eastwood-esque, be like, I know what you're thinking. Did he have five cookies or six? Time to ask yourself one question. Got milk? Well, do ya? 
punk and that <laughs> that was like my i don't know 13 year old self coming up with that so it was know. good did you have that <laughs> deep of a voice at 13 or probably not it was probably a little <laughs> bit more crackly like yeah, I'm old, old, yeah. Old, yeah. Punk. i'd actually rather hear the 13 year old version <laughs> of you tell me that story I, i'm i'm sorry i can't <laughs> I, I can't turn back time if i could i'd be rich you know type totally, thing. Totally. but yeah that was my my idea back then I but like it. you know i've always enjoyed coming up with hooks and taglines totally and stuff like that, so. it's funny it's like um being in advertising is a lot like being in comedy because everyone comes up to you and tells you they could do your <laughs> job <laughs> they're like i know oh I'm, you know this I'm you sorry. know no don't i'm sorry a- to be that guy no don't <laughs> apologize i just think it's funny that it happens in both my professional and personal career yes. that people are like oh you know what i could do what you do <laughs> exactly exactly that happened too when i was doing radio yeah and stuff like that or I'm they sure. want you to do your job while you're not at work like oh yeah yeah hey could you uh i've had people tell me just to like introduce something that's happening or narrate something that's going on in like a radio voice or something or i'm like in nascar you don't have somebody like oh you're a nascar driver <laughs> oh you want to go out in the parking lot and just turn left for a while can i watch <laughs> that um oh my god i have doesn't someone happen at subway today <laughs> <laughs> that was like Stephanie can you do a skit for us and I was like I don't I don't do skits that's not even what I do tell me I'm a offended. joke <laughs> I when I say that I'm like no that's not how it works it's not like a dance monkey dance situation yeah. like respect my <laughs> respect my craft <laughs> I know people expect it to be like everybody like Rodney Dangerfield where you have like the totally. one-liners like hey, my wife's so dumb she has to reach inside a broad account to two type thing yeah you know and with stand up, as you can attest to, there's a lot of setup for the punchline. So it'd be Absolutely. like, I could tell you a story if you want. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, well, and then a half of it's not work appropriate. So that's an issue. Yeah. I yeah. had coworkers come and see my stand up. Um, that was a new experience. <laughs> <laughs> Did they all come out to uh, Cobbs when you were with uh, yeah. Kabir? Yeah. Yep. I realized you had a huge cheering section. I did. I did. I mean, the business side of it, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I uh, I co-won that night with Xander, and Xander was hilarious, and I brought all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that part was cool. But yeah, definitely. Right on. So let's backtrack a little bit to how cool. you got into stand-up comedy. Yeah. From the business side of the advertising world. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a convoluted story. Um, but I, about like a year and a half ago, I was just kind of feeling itchy in my job, didn't like what I was doing. And so I moved to Barcelona. Okay. And I actually started doing comedy there. Really? Um, so I'd done a couple of open mics in San Francisco, but the job was always so busy here that I never could get out in time to make the open mics and make the time to make your name and do all yeah. the hard work that's necessary that everyone talks about. It's real. No one gets past it. It's the only way through. Um, Very true. <laughs> Unless you become a reality TV star. And exactly. then you can just be like, hey, guys, I'm kind of funny. Let me uh, cool. stand up yeah, there and talk. Let me, let me know if that works out for someone. Um, <laughs> For the rest of us. Uh, So anyways, I moved to Barcelona. Life was a lot easier there. So I started doing stand-up in the expat community there. So we had everyone from like Canadians, Americans, British. I mean like the works, right? So you didn't have to learn Spanish with a lift? No, (laughs) I mean I did, (laughs) but I didn't have to. (laughs) Um, But it was nice because it was a real challenge to write jokes that were universal um, most of the crowd was always tourists yeah. and so you never knew where they were from and, and you couldn't ever drop anything from your childhood or anything that you felt was like an experience that everyone had gone through because it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, so that was a real challenge. And then I came back and visited San Francisco for a wedding, did a couple of, um, shows while I was out here and just the difference in the opportunity in San Francisco was just I don't know it was insurmountable for me to think in my mind like oh I finally found this thing that I wanted to do why would I not put all my effort behind doing it 
Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I understand what you were saying about like the context of things, like people not getting it. Cause like back, I'm, I'm originally from the Midwest in Iowa and there's a grocery store chain that I had like a long bit about yeah. that I did. And I came out here and I was like, nobody knows what the hell that is. Yeah, totally. It was, it was about like the, uh, the employees there being dressed like Mormons <laughs> and stuff like that, but nobody had the context to it. Exactly. So you had to find something else that would relate universally to them. Totally. Well, I mean, so much of my stuff is political because of my family and where I'm from. And, and so not being able to touch on any of that was so difficult. Um, and it's been such a like the the first thing I wanted to do when I moved back. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So how long have you been doing stand up now? Um, right at a year. Okay. Yeah. I am like still a baby. Yeah, definitely. I've heard somebody say like each year you've been doing stand up is like a year of this sounds very repetitive until I explain it. It's <laughs> like a year of your life. So like you do stand up, you're like your I your comedy IQ is like that of a one year old. Exactly. Uh, do two two years, you know. Yeah. That and like a lot of times they say it like takes about seven years till you like start getting like bigger things and totally. well-known stuff like that yeah so where you do a lot of political stuff do you draw comedy from other things or what aspects of the of the political uh, arena do you go after um well so i grew up in a really small town in texas okay and my entire family are not only trump supporters but like maybe the biggest trump supporters <laughs> you could find um so i draw a lot of content from that and the dichotomy between those two things and like how difficult it is to mentally separate people being your family and people who think basically the opposite of what you think yeah um and all the funny things that go along with that and going home for christmas and spending it there versus being you know my granola San Francisco self <laughs> here. I draw a lot of content from just being a woman in the universe right now and what that feels like and funny things and comparing and I make fun of myself dating. Um, I mean, it's just whatever I'm experiencing, I write about. Whatever's funny to me in real life, whatever's happening, whatever I have to start laughing about because it's so painful, Yeah, I write about that. Okay. All right. So I got a question for you. After seeing you on stage and talking to you here, do you put on a little bit of a character on stage or um, is that just another side of you? I, that's, it's funny. Good question. I don't really know. Okay. Cause it, it seems like you got a little, almost a little bit of hustle on stage. Yeah. Like, um, I guess I'll, I'll compare it to this. I actually DJed at a strip club for a while. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you're like a stripper, all right? But it, it reminded me of some of the game, like playing, like, because in some aspects, like, as you're, like, doing some jokes, you play dumb a little bit. Oh, but, yeah, like, I could yeah, tell, yeah, I'm like, yeah. I can tell she's smarter than that <laughs> up there. And, yeah, totally. And, you know, in order to play to that crowd. Yeah, so, I think it's... It's part of it is definitely an act and part of it is definitely like what makes the joke funny. Yeah. Right. I think, um, you know, you're catching me at work on the business side and I've like been <laughs> having important business meetings all day. <laughs> if my boss is listening. Um, but you I'm know, sure he will. Uh, yeah, exactly. But on stage, I have to have like so much confidence, so much swagger, so much all of these things for some of the jokes to land. Otherwise, they just wouldn't. So I think it's a bit of a character, but I think it's like kind of who I wish I could be all the time is just okay. like that, you know, like just doesn't give a shit, says whatever they want, it's like exactly <laughs> how it is and like very nonchalant about it. Um, but in my typical life, I'm very PC. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to see what some people are like on and off stage. <laughs> yeah. Some people are the same. Like yeah, if that's I'm, true. I'm guessing if you saw Chris Farley on set and He'd Chris Farley exact, off set, yeah. it's the same or dude. Do you think? But, or maybe like because he's so intense on set, like he has to have a break from that. There are people like that too that on, are on stage. They're completely extroverted. Yeah. Off stage, they're like, I don't talk to people that's um, fair i've met those <laughs> comedians before but i would venture to say that every comedian has to turn off 
Yeah. There's like there's a space where that they have to completely turn off because there's so much that's demanded of you when you're asked to be on and doing that thing that I think you have to have some kind of off switch. True, true. Even if it is just stepping away, having a little bit of alone time. Totally. But, like, I don't know, with me personally, like when I'm in front of people and I'm getting laughs, yeah. whether I'm on stage or just having a conversation, that energizes me. Totally. Like, I'm like, okay, okay. Um, not necessarily thinking, what can I say funny? What can I say funny? Because that's when you say stupid shit. Oh, my uh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was I was at a show on Sunday night. Oh, God, what was his name? He was so good. He was hosting at um, Punchline, and he was saying the exact same thing. He was trying to do some crowd work, and this guy was giving him fucking nothing. <laughs> and he was just like, do you know what's happening in my head right now? Do you know the anxiety? <laughs> I am, like, searching, and you're giving me nothing. And it's, uh, God, we've all been there, right? Yeah, that's rough when you're trying to do crowd work in the crowd. Yes, like, nothing just... gives me more anxiety than crowd work. I'm still working on it. Okay, with you, personally, I'll, I'll tell you how I feel, but if you have like a relatively small crowd or a huge crowd, which one intimidates you more? Small crowd. All right, same here. And uh, yeah. why, why do you say that? Uh, again, just less to work with, right? I mean, and, and depending how you're doing the crowd work, sometimes if it's like call-out response. yeah. When you have that bigger crowd, even though it's not an applause, the fact that you're getting that feedback is super helpful. Yes, yes. And I, I agree. I think also part of it is, too, when people are, like, alone in the crowd or just a few people out there, yeah. they're too self-conscious to laugh and let go. <laughs> yeah. When they're with the masses and the ma the crowd, the, the whole mass is laughing, yeah. they feel a lot easier to let free, let go. Well, yeah, that, and it's a numbers game, right? I mean, my humor and your humor have to be on opposite sides of the spectrum, just being humans. Yeah. And so what I find funny and what you find funny are so wildly different that the more people I have in the room, the more chances I have that someone's going to appreciate my kind of <laughs> very humor. True, very right? true. Very true. And then just to your point earlier, once you get one laugh, it's a contagious thing and it starts to pick up and that doesn't happen in a small room. You could be killing that small room, oh but you're God. not getting the feeling of it. I think that's what like most people don't understand about stand-up comedy is that we go and tell the same jokes over and over and over and over and over <laughs> and drive them into the ground for us Yes. to the point where we almost hate our own jokes because we've told them so many times, but the reaction you get from crowd to crowd is so different. I think a lot of my friends who have started to come to multiple shows, that's what they've been so shocked by. They're like, that killed at the last stage. I'm like, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was there, but thank you so much for that feedback. But thank you for noticing. Thank you, you know? for noticing. It's a parka. Thank um, you for being attentive. Yeah. Uh, one of my best friends was actually the worst heckler I've ever had at a show. Really, your friend was? She she a hundred percent was. Um, she claimed she didn't really get stand up comedy, <laughs> but I don't know how many rules there were. Yeah, she just thought it was like a one on one conversation we were having in front of the crowd. And that that's rough with your friend. It depends on what your relationship's like. You can't tell if you can't if, tell them to shut the fuck up in front of a crowd of people. Friends out here. No. Friends no. back home in the Midwest, <laughs> they'd be like, gosh, oh, shut up, you fucker. Like <laughs> but honestly, like back home in Texas, I feel like that would just instigate and make it worse, right? Yeah, and possibly, possibly. Like, I, yeah, I did one show in Austin and the crowd was awesome, but I can't imagine venturing outside of Austin and my show going well. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know. It's it would be interesting to take your show to a more conservative area. Like, yeah. So how do you play to the different crowds? Like, say, if mm. you found yourself in front of a conservative audience that wasn't quite laughing at all, like, say, the political jokes you're throwing out. Yeah. What would you do? I just go straight to my dating stuff. Okay. You know, I mean, you got to think about it like with any... I work in advertising, right? So audience has always been important and you always speak directly to whatever audience is in front of you, not yourself, yeah. not anyone else, not the brand. Um, 
so that's always kind of been something that's instinctual for me because okay. I've worked on this side of the business. Uh, and I've always kind of tailored it that way. I was talking to one of the other comedians about potentially doing like a sorority tour and going to all the local sorority houses and doing comedy for them. And um, like I would absolutely tailor it to dating and guys and all that kind of thing. Um, I, I think you have to do that. Okay, have you ever been in the situation where a joke is like kind of bombing? Mm -hmm. And you're. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. I, I, every comic has been in that situation. No, never, no, I, no I've I, never bombed. I don't I know never what you're talking bombed. about. I, all my shit is gold. <laughs> I have never not been amazing. And. <laughs> Sorry for thinking otherwise. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> okay. But you know how you're saying that you typically try to tailor to the audience. Yeah. Have you ever been in a joke where you're like, screw this. I'm sticking with this joke no matter what the crowd is doing. Just because either you want to work something out or you want to prove to them that you're going to make this joke funny. Huh. That's funny. Um, I mean, no, I'm a total bailer. Okay. If it's not working, my thought is, why waste it on this crowd, right? Okay. If I get far enough down something and I'm like, oh, okay, clearly you guys aren't liking that. Plus, there's so many like quick jokes you have in your back pocket when you're bombing to help get the crowd back on your side. So I usually bail out and I'm like, oh, no, too uncomfortable. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to something I know will work. <laughs> all right fair enough fair enough yeah. that could be especially when you only have a certain amount of time on stage especially when you're doing open mics and yeah. you only get like five minutes if that exactly you can't. I ha I'm not like too prideful <laughs> to the, I'm like oh no this joke needs to work I'm like oh cool I'm never telling that one again <laughs> Or at least not in front of you dicks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get like more of an edge and be meaner so I can be better at handling hecklers. But I just that's tough for me. I was actually just going to move towards that since you, you mentioned like one of your best friends was like your yeah. worst heckler. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I get hecklers at almost every show. Now, is it somebody like there's in my mind, there's two different kinds of hecklers. OK, they're still horrible for a comedy show but there's the heckler that's kind of against you uh -huh. or, and then the heckler that wants to be part of the show <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh can i tell you who i hate more yeah sure the Wouldn't... person who wants to be part of the show no actually they're innocent the other person is worse because they took time out of their day to come yell at a stranger while they're taking their time to try and do something I just yeah. don't understand that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, why did you come to the show if you're going right? to be, be like that? I you like know? barely made it to the show, dude. <laughs> 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 like, how did you take time out of your show to come and huckle me? But I don't know. I think that's one of the things that women get a lot worse than men do. Um, I don't know why that is, but it's unfortunate. I think part of that has to do... With a lot of women's persona on stage is a lot more nicer and innocent. Yeah. And even in some cases insecure. Uh, like That's intentionally. Fair. Like, you yeah. know, the whole looking at your shoes telling jokes. Yeah. And then people are like, oh, okay, I can heckle this guy. And a lot of guys are more like in your face style comedy, like kind of like a Dennis Leary type thing yeah. or like uh, um, Bill Burr, who just like will yeah. take hecklers straight on. That's true. So. I wonder, like, I need to practice that, but how do you practice that? I yell at homeless people on the street. Oh, that seems, <laughs> that seems unkind. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. I'm just practicing for hecklers. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> yes, yes. No, no. I guess you just have to, you know, at one point, just try developing a backbone on stage, like being like, okay, I'm going to take this guy head on. And you may you may fail miserably but what if i offer it up one friday to the office i just like i'm sitting in a chair and anyone can just come and say something horrible to me and i have to respond to them that that could that could work cuz the you know in an office full of such creative people who work at Pereira Odell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pereira Odell, that's where we are. The sweet sweet angels of Pereira Odell. Um yeah. I mean, that might be an option. That could help. 
yeah, I get the creative the team to fire come hate. together. <laughs> just like, okay, today Creatively. just pop in whenever you want and just give me your best insult. Honestly, I Nothing think Nothing is would off be the table. So HR funny. will not be called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> HR doesn't know about this. I'll be in glass case of emotion. That's what one of our conference rooms is called. Oh, really? Yeah, we have some very good conference A little rooms. Anchorman reference. Yeah, we have a conference room called um, Shirt No Pants. <laughs> SNP. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good ones. Is that rule enforced? No, I think it was like from, it's an old agency story. Someone was driving home from something. I don't know. I wasn't listening. Um, okay, then I won't ask you to go into detail. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> All right. Before we get into the second half of the show, yeah, uh, I got just a couple more questions to throw your way. Like, say, I know you were talking about people coming up telling you how to do your job. Yeah. Or like, oh, I can do my job better. Now, how do you react when you step off stage and somebody gives you a possible tag? to uh, one of your jokes like here's here's just a, be like here's just an idea yeah. you know um for this joke abc you know and what do you how do you take that as credible or do you like just kind of like oh, okay yeah here's another jackass here's another jackass i mean if i was a wise person i think i would just like keep my ears open and always listen to everyone's opinion and then whatever but at that point, like so many people do it. Yeah. But there are people in my life when they came, come up, I trust their opinion. Yeah. Or if they were to say something, I would listen. Or there's people that I go to and I'm like, okay, can I just run some things by you? Is there like a there there? And and that is like immensely helpful. But there's very few people that I can do that with. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. And I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, I think a lot of times it depends on how that person comes up to you with the tagline, too. Totally. Like, you look at all that like, hey, I'm no, yeah. Stephanie, I got a tag for you type thing. Um, yeah, you're not going to listen to that, but... That, but I think it's more than that. I think it's like, I would have to know them before to yeah. trust their opinion. No stranger could walk up to me and be like, you know what you should do? Yeah, yeah. Unless it was like another comic that I saw their stuff and I was like, dang, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. Very cool. I would listen to that. So don't approach her after shows with the suggestions for uh, jokes, people. Yeah, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> go, go to hell. Uh, <laughs> Buy me a drink. <laughs> don't tell me how to write a joke. Thank you. There, Bye. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. And speaking of joke writing, do you yes. have a process? Oh, my gosh. Um, Like a messy one. I always have a running list and a notebook on me. So if I ever think of little thought starters, I have those in a running list. And then whenever I have time to actually sit down and write, I start with that list and just start blowing out those ideas. Okay. And then I always try and form it into a story. Um, Something with an arc, something like, how can I tell this over 10 minutes? How do all these little bits fit together? Um just the organization of that and how it works makes a lot of sense in my mind. Okay. And that's how I start to memorize stuff for shows. Okay. Very cool. Is there a certain, do you have a special place where you feel more comfortable writing like a coffee shop or Um, a tent camping or totally outdoors? I write like crazy. It's insane. Like I have to get out of the city. Um, and it's perfect. I, I get a lot of thought starters from going to open mics and just hearing everybody else and being in the space. And then it reminds you of something you thought of and yada, yada. But to actually sit down and write, I need like clear space. Okay. All right. So now I have a set of questions that's kind of set to help other people get into the entertainment industry. And I like to keep it specific to my guest. Cool. Uh, To get things started, what advice would you give somebody who is looking to get into stand-up comedy or even take their stage presence to the next level? Um, If you're first starting out, I think what I would recommend is go to as many local comic shows as humanly possible. Okay. um, And start there. Don't start with the big things. Don't watch Netflix. Don't, (laughs) like, don't go chasing waterfalls, girl stick to the open mics that you're used to. 
Um, Thank you, T-Boss. <laughs> start, start at the <laughs> ground level. That was so helpful for me just to see what they were doing and what that looked like. And it gave me confidence of like, you know, someone would suck and I'd be like, all right, shit, I could do that. I mean, yeah. I'm not that bad. And as terrible as that sounds, like it was motivating to be able to like, okay, I can get up there. And then you meet some of the other comics and then you have someone to write with or someone to just throw stuff off with. Um, if you've been doing it for a while to up your game, the best piece of advice I can give you is surround yourself with people you don't have to explain yourself to. Um, you don't have to explain what you're doing. That comedy is important. It's a dream of yours. You don't have to explain the voice that you're after or the things that you're saying or the humor that you have. Yeah. It's people who already get you and what you're doing because those are the people who are going to motivate you forward. And the hardest part about comedy is getting everyone else's voice out of your head and just having your own. That right there sounds really simple to get other people's voices out of your head, but it's, it's not. It's not like you hear some comic do something and you don't want to take something from somebody else. So it's like you got to. I like, mean, it's that it's I'm writing this joke about my family. Is this going to hurt my mom's feelings? What is she going to? What is she going to think when she hears this? What yeah. is my dad going to think when she, he hears that I'm making this joke about my mother? Like, <laughs> there, there's those voices. There's ah. like, oh, is this funny enough? No, that's not funny enough. Um, I, I mean, it's everything, right? Yeah, definitely. So you're thinking of the outside voices as far as like uh, parents, subjects of the joke and stuff like that, how they're going to react. Yeah, to just you. like anyone's opinion of that. Like, will this resonate with anyone else? Um, is this just something that's funny for me? I mean, there's just so many things that go into it and so many things that you think about and you end up killing things before you even give them a chance to breathe. Yeah. So how do you establish it? Like you said, is this only funny to me? How do you like uh, figure that out? You go on stage and you say it out loud and see if anyone else laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> or if you're the only one laughing Yeah, on I mean, I think the biggest mistake that you can make is run your jokes by too many people or run too many filters through it before yeah. you just go out there and throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. I mean, it's really the only way. And it's honestly the shit that like you kind of just say in passing or like the transition between jokes or whatever it is. And that's what ends up getting a bigger laugh. And you're like, Oh, that's where the there is. <laughs> okay. I can chase yeah. that. I know my direction now. Now I can triple down on what's funny. So I think it's like getting up there and failing as much as you humanly can, because that's only going to come with finding success too. Gotcha. Gotcha. So do you record yourself? Yeah. Every time. Every time. All right. So uh -huh. you go back, watch, pick out, okay, that worked there, that worked. Cause it's a Oh yeah. I mean, right before shows, I'll go listen to multiple ways of how I told the joke and listen to where I got the biggest laugh and make sure I had that pause because that was really funny. And I just said that offhand, but shit, that got a big laugh. I'm going to try that again. Yeah. And everything, just thinking about it as an experiment and not like a success or failure, but just being interested in like, oh, I got a laugh, didn't get a laugh, got a laugh, didn't get a laugh. But not taking the not getting a laugh personally is still so hard to do. Yeah, definitely. There, It's like, especially when you think that it's going to get a laugh. Yeah. Like if you have that feeling, oh, this is going to kill, then you yeah, say it and everyone, you hear yeah. nothing, crickets. Everyone always asks what that feels like. And I'm like, you know what that feels like. You've been a circle full of people and you've tried to make a joke that you thought was super funny and no one laughed. I was like, what does that feel like to you? Now multiply, <laughs> multiply that times however many people are in the room when yes. I do it. And that's what it feels like. And plus, when they say something stupid, they can kind of back away out of the circle totally. and just kind of disappear for a no minute. No one paid them You're to say something funny. You're standing on stage with a spotlight and a microphone. <laughs> There's no hiding. There is no hiding. So how do you handle that when they uh, joke bombs? Oh, God. Um, I usually just try to have something funny in my back pocket to win the crowd back. Okay. Uh I mean, it'll even just be something as simple as like, well, never tell that fucking joke again. <laughs> and, you know, people are like, Haha, that's great. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. So I actually kind of expect hopefully to hear something a little different on this question since <laughs> okay. since your career is in advertising and marketing and on the business side. OK. All right. So what are you doing to promote yourself? 
Oh my gosh, so many things. No uh, pressure. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, I like to do a lot on social. Okay. Um, I stick to Instagram only. Uh, do a lot of stories. I do a lot of interactive stuff. So people are like sending me stuff and I'm posting what they're sharing and trying to get people super involved. Okay. Um, I think for the Cobbs thing, I got 120 people on my guest list, which was awesome. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I got that because I like put a purpose bigger than me behind it. I was the first female to ever win the Cobbs comedy contest. And wow. so I found that out, like that no female had won before, like maybe a couple weeks before. So my social strategy was just to talk about that. Like, hey, you guys come out and help me be the first female to ever win this. And that's such a hot topic item right now. So instead of just trying to create a wave of noise on my own, I used a wave that was already super huge and yeah. just tapped into it. Um, so I don't know. I... I try to be very sparing with the shows that I do promote. I don't promote all of them. Um, I mean, I'll do a little bit for all of them, but n some I'll really double down on. So I'm not annoying people and asking them <laughs> for stuff constantly because no one likes that comic friend either. Yeah. So it's being human on there. And I don't just post about comedy. I mean, you know, as comics, we are our brand. Um, so I post about my personal life and what's going on there. And I just try to be normal and myself and worth following okay okay so that that's interesting though like you put your personal life into it too because there there is a balance i think that totally. you have to walk between all business and all personal because absolutely you are trying to promote something but yeah i mean uh, to that point like I've talked about it with other comics, too, is we all have a line, right? Like, we're all human beings. We're all, like, trying to live this life, too. I have a job. I There are some things I have to be careful about with that. Um, dating. I refuse to ever talk about any current dating situation yeah. on stage, on podcast, on anything, because I don't think that's fair. So I'll who are you dating right now? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, his name is, um, oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, we'll skip that one. Oh, next time, <laughs> I guys. told you this wasn't an I Got You Fucker podcast. I I'm know. sorry. Don't I lie lied. to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know. That's definitely part of it. I mean, I don't post a lot about my family on there because that can kind of get a little uncomfortable if people yeah. have heard my jokes <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know yeah there's definitely lines and i think it's a fluid thing that you just figure out as you go i did not expect people to reach out so much on social channels as they have but that's an interesting thing that i'm getting used to Okay. Okay. So like what kind of people do you have reaching out to just fans or like that? Like people who have seen shows. So they're like, Oh, I didn't want to come say hi, but it was like a great show or I saw you at this show or I've started to have like, um, like be at a bar and someone be like, Oh, I saw you at Cobb. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, cool. This is really fun. So, you know, like clearly, I'm not cool enough for that to be annoying yet. It's just really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yes. I haven't made it to that point yet either where it's like, oh, you recognize me? Go away. Go away. I think it's happened like one and a half times, but um, I talk about it like it's happened 24 times. So. Hey, you know, you got to make things seem bigger than you are. It's the entertainment industry. Yeah, come on. You know, Let I'm me getting promote noticed myself. everywhere I go. <laughs> People are coming up to me, buying me drinks. and <laughs> Exactly. You get it. You get it. Yeah. You make it seem like it's a cool thing to do. <laughs> All right, that is actually some really good advice, kind of find that mix, and I'm sure it takes a little bit of experimentation to see yeah. what you feel comfortable with and what your audience responds to totally. as well. So uh, that that is a really good piece of advice right there. Now, you said you've been doing stand-up for roughly a year now. Mm -hmm. um, to this point, like, what would be a highlight or two that you care to share with the uncontained audience? Totally. I think one of the highlights would be, I mean, just the very first time of going on stage and doing stand-up. Like, you're such a freaking nervous wreck. You have <laughs> no idea what it's going to be like. 
uh, even though you're in an open mic with a ton of other people. I mean, I actually was sitting next to this girl last night at an open mic, and it was her very first time doing comedy. And before, like, her hands were shaking, paper in her hand, and... You know, she went up there and killed it and did great. And <laughs> she could not wipe the shitting grin off of her face. So uh, that's definitely, I had a very similar experience of like, went up for the first time. Some stuff failed, but other stuff like really killed. And that feeling of making an uh, entire room laugh. Yeah. It's unbeatable. It is. So what was the experience like for you? Getting up on stage, were you nervous? Were oh you God. like sweating bullets? or So nervous. You know, I was in a different country with all brand new friends. Uh, and like so many more people had showed up than I thought. And it was for freaking open mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never been on stage. And I was like, this is such a bad choice. Um but I went up there and one of the jokes killed and I still like tell a version of that joke now. Nice. Um, which is cool. And then I think the other big highlight for me was um, co-winning that contest with Xander at Cobbs. I mean, it was just enough to have 120 people come and support you to do something you just started less than a year ago. Yeah. But they just totally believe in what you're doing and that was cool um but then actually winning it being the first woman was like a really cool portion of it for me um my mom was there um it was just such a fun night I mean I was walking on air for weeks um so yeah those were the two two big ones very cool. Okay, you had your first on stage experience mm -hmm. in Spain. Yeah. All right. What was it like your first time on stage back here? Totally shat the bed. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. And like none of my friends from the States had seen me before, so they came to that show. Dude, I got so nervous. I think it was at Bar Fluxus. I like totally forgot my whole set up there. I've never blinked like that before. I mean, like, I could not find a joke in my repertoire really? to pull. And I, I I, don't know what happened. I just got so nervous, so in my head. I just started telling, like, a, like, a story I had never told before. Then I finally found it a couple seconds later, and I was like, oh, fuck that. <laughs> like, <laughs> started a new joke and, you know, ended up being okay, but... That first couple of minutes, I have it on record, and I cannot listen to it. It's so painful. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had sets like that, too, where oh, it's like, oh, I don't want to go back there. Well, and like <laughs> most of the time, I would say those sets are avoidable, even though they have to happen, right? Yeah. You didn't prepare. You didn't do the time. Like, whatever it was, there was probably something you could have done to make that better. It's very rarely, like... The crowd's just horrible, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. You know, I learned one thing uh, quickly. when I, I was working yeah. at the radio station and introducing a band. And there, was, there wasn't there was a big crowd there yet. It was at the beginning of the night. And uh, as I was uh, walking away, I was kind of disappointed with the response that I got. And I was like, oh, man, there's nobody out there. Good luck. Then the singer for the band was he just said there's nobody out here. Are you guys like, are you guys feeling it? Like this, like, I was like, oh shit. Uh, it, it dawned on me that if anybody's there, you got to treat them like it's a full house. Yeah. You know, yep. whether or not you're getting the feedback from them, 100%. you gotta, gotta give it to them. Like they're all there. Totally. Yeah. And I think that's so, so difficult to do, especially when you're like third open mic of the night and you're, there's three people in the crowd and you're like, God damn it. Why didn't I even come to this? Like, how are you supposed to give them what you would give a crowd uh, to cops? Yeah, you know? exactly. That's it's, so hard. It is. It is. Um, so does your, does your style change when it's a small crowd and a big crowd? Yeah, definitely. Like even the way that I am on stage changes. If I'm in a small crowd, I, my ass is on the stool and I'm not moving. <laughs> if I'm in a bigger crowd, like I need to work the stage, get to that side, tell them a joke, come over here. Like I, I, yeah, I handle it completely differently. I mean, think about it. It's just like, 
you would never speak to five people the way you would speak to a hundred. You'd look no. like a silly person. It, it would be a little bit interesting to yeah. be that guy just screaming in front of like five people. Totally. <laughs> yeah. No one wants that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when somebody does come out and see you perform, yeah. when they, when you actually have that full audience or even even the small audience yeah what do you want your audience to go home and remember about your set um that's a really good question I think I just want it to make them think okay you know like there's Uh, definitely the humor part of it yeah but I think the best way comedy has been explained to me is we're the debate team but cool (laughs) <laughs> um, we actually have like legitimate shit we want to say and I think for the majority of comedians that's why they're out there doing it they feel yeah. there is something they need to say and they have a voice and way to do that so I think that's what it would be um, a lot of my stuff ends up being about like women's issues because those are my issues um, so it's probably going to be about that but okay yeah alright so basically you want them to think about the issues that you're dealing with yeah definitely yeah see a different perspective exactly yeah all right it's been awesome talking to you i got one more question for you here i appreciate you taking me in here this (laughs) awesome place you got this that's a a fake bear skin on the ground i think it's fake right it is fake but it actually has fake claws too which are great um, so thank you again, Prera Odell, for giving me a job and a place <laughs> to do this podcast. Yeah, and there's, um, I don't know, I'm just being ADD right now. I'll get back <laughs> on track. I was going to explain everything. There's like toy trucks and school buses and laundry detergent and <laughs> like. <laughs> so fun, all of our past clients. I figured it was something like that. Mm-hmm. So you had, did you have Kiss as a client? Oh, I hope so. I th- I see something kiss wise on oh. top of like an old FM radio. Maybe this is just cool radio. stuff. I don't know. I haven't worked here for very long. I'm a freelancer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they love me like one of their own. All right, fair enough. That's what matters. That's what matters. <laughs> so before I get to that final question, <laughs> yes. Uh, where can people get a hold of you at? What's your corner of the internet? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram, Slew Foster, S L U F O S T E R. Okay. Um, that's the best place. That's where I post about all the shows, upcoming stuff. I'm going to be in LA this weekend. I'm going to New York in two weekends. Um, and doing comedy all over the place. Oh, very cool. Yeah. All right, cool. So check out her Instagram and uh, see where she'll be. Apparently, she's all over the country now. Yeah. So uh, maybe she's coming to a city near you. So I have that one final question for you, the title question of the show. Okay. Stephanie Foster. How do you live uncontained? How do I live uncontained? Well, I think I can answer that in a couple of different ways. The first one is like logistically. Um, I don't have a nine to five job. I'm a full time freelancer. Sometimes I take off for a couple of months and go travel and do comedy. I just moved back from living in Barcelona for the last year and a half. Wow. Um, And I worked as a freelancer and remotely there as well. So it's just kind of been like whatever opportunity arises saying yes to and figuring out the details and how it works once I get there. Um, I think from a mental perspective, uh, I grew up in a pretty conservative family and I've always been the black sheep there and kind of (laughs) rocked the boat. Um, So I've always kind of been a challenger and, um, and I think, I think that's what makes my comedy interesting because I'm just constantly challenging the things around me. Um, if that, if it feels right, if it feels good, if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest challenges thus far have been just the voice inside my own head and limiting yourself and, just not going for everything and not feeling confident or like I'm good enough and having that imposter syndrome. Oh, the dreaded imposter syndrome. Like even after winning, it was like, oh, I only won because my friends were there. Um, <laughs> it's just like shitty things like that or getting on stage after a rough night. I mean, that 
that voice inside your head gets so loud when you bomb it's just <laughs> saying i told you so yes definitely and, and just just so you know i was there i didn't know you and i thought you were funny and that's why i asked <laughs> you on my show so <laughs> tell that imposter syndrome to shut the hell up yeah honestly. and tell some and tell me a joke <laughs> <laughs> yeah fuck off imposter syndrome <laughs> That's my words of advice for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like reminding yourself how great you are. And again, just surrounding yourself with people who already believe in what you're doing. So you yeah. don't waste your time convincing anyone around you about what you're doing. You just have those people who are like, hey, have you gone to an open mic this week? Um, are you writing? Are you doing that? Like people who are really pushing you to be better and do things differently. Um the more people you have around you doing that, the easier it becomes. That is some good advice right there too. surround yourself with the like minded people in a way. Yeah. Um, at least for the creativity sense anyway. Totally. You know? Totally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Was there anything that you've had to sacrifice in order to mm. uh, pursue stand up? Um, that's a, uh, I think I've had to like sacrifice some respect. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, I don't think I have had everybody in my life super stoked that I'm doing stand up. Yeah. Um, or that I'm talking about some of the things that I'm talking about or using the language that I'm using. Um, so that's been really hard because, you know, I think you want the people closest to you to be really stoked for you. Yeah. Um, so some some have been and been amazing and my parents have been like such a cool support system even though like I talk about my first blowjob on stage <laughs> when my dad heard that saw me live for the first time I told that joke and he was laughing harder than anyone in the room really like that part's super cool so you know I think you just have to constantly put your focus towards the good things it's like you know that's the old parable of like feeding the good wolf or the bad wolf. Like where are you going to put your focus? What yeah. are you going to care about? The person who is telling you you're not good enough or the person who's like, God, you're so funny. I'm going to listen to the person that's telling me I'm funny because that's where I want to go. Okay. That is, that's awesome right there. I, I first you had me lost at the good wolf and the bad wolf. Oh, have you not heard it? Do you want I, me to tell you? Sure. Let, let, <laughs> let's hear a story. Story time. <laughs> Sitting next to the bearskin rug. I know. This is actually really funny. Just, okay. need, just need like a fire burning in the background. and. So, <laughs> 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 so I don't really remember the whole thing, but the gist of it is there's like this grandfather talking to his grandson and he's telling them the story of two wolves. And okay. this one wolf is feeding into fear and um, envy and all of these things and the other one is feeding into um, confidence and strength and blah, 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 blah. And the grandson asks, well, which wolf w wins in the end? And he says, the one that you feed. Um, okay. So whichever wolf is stronger within you is the one that's going. To eat the other one. Exactly. Okay. All yeah. Right, so cool. you got to make sure that you're feeding the right wolf. All right. Then. It's like an Aesop's <laughs> fable almost, you know? We're, we're you enlightening know, people here. You know, here. you get comedy from me. You get fables. Like, what? A get advertising, business God, advice. God, I know. am just... I'm and I'm still stuck on this bearskin rug. <laughs> and, so, and somehow I'm still single. So, <laughs> here we go. All right, all right. So... I have one final thing for you to do. Okay. But first, I'd like to thank you for coming on my show. Yeah. And uh, sharing stories about good wolves and bad wolves <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you know, all the other advice that you shared. But I think I might have to call this good wolf, bad wolf or Ooh, something like that. I don't I know. I like it. Feed the wolf. Feed the wolf. Or, I don't know. It, it's a work in progress right oh now. Gosh, I got a little a, while. There's a wolf pun in there somewhere. There's a wolf in comics clothing or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I don't know. We'll we'll have to come up with something here. But okay. um we can do that after the show. We won't <laughs> make people wait for it. Uh <laughs> they wanted to hear about my process. They can just listen yeah, to yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> this is the creative process at its <laughs> finest, folks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for real, thank you for coming on. And I have one final thing for you to do. Will you do me the honor of signing off the show tonight? Sure thing. I'm Stephanie Foster and I live uncontained.
And that does it for another episode of Uncontained. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Stephanie Foster for joining me on the episode, and Pereira Odell for letting us do the interview right there in the office with that kick-ass bearskin rug. I'll have to put a picture up of it before too long on my Instagram, which is Uncontained Pod, and it's the same on Instagram and Twitter as well if you want to follow along with the show and get updates when new episodes come out and uh, updates on past guests as well. Um, Please, please uh, share this episode with a friend that you think will enjoy it and... uh, There is no advertising power as good as the word of mouth. So go out there and tell your friends to listen. And don't take no for an answer. That's right. Anyway, so go out there and tell your friends to listen and don't take no for an answer. And make them leave a review on their favorite podcast player as well. After all, they want to be just like you. And with that being said, until next time, live uncontained.